I, uh, like Jessica was saying, am looking at the connection between capacity and sustainable development and environmental impact assessment in Northern Canada specifically. Um, I first wanted to remind everybody, uh, which I think many of us are aware of, but it's a good reminder to think about sustainable development in terms of, conne of a connection between economy, society, and the biosphere. And by biosphere, I really mean the environment. And so things like environmental impact assessment help us connect those um, three sectors to really uh, make good decisions about how to move forward on certain projects and in certain um, aspects of our, of our development. In the Canadian North, this is especially true, um, especially as the region uh, gets opened up into new and exciting um, resource development, but also in terms of giving local control over to um, uh, local governments to make these decisions and how to do that better and with more um, integrity towards those uh, local voices while still trying to um, balance the economy the social aspects and then the environmental aspects of each of the development projects. So my research really focuses on Northern Canada in the three territories generally, but then also uh, focusing in on the Yukon as a particular example of the situation. Um, in the past, the territories were uh, under the control of the federal government of Canada and they provided services to the territories under their jurisdiction. Over the years, uh, we've moved towards uh, a shift in those responsibilities to territorial government. In the case of the Yukon, this happened throughout the 80s and the 90s um, and progressively. So it started out with things like health and social services and then moved into education. And then finally, we're in the process of uh, moving responsibility towards land use and um, resource management and water management. This becomes interesting because it's also happening on the First Nations side. Um, since the Umbrella Final Agreement was uh, signed back in the late 80s, um, we are seeing a shift in those responsibilities also to the First Nations governments. So we're looking at a similar movement of health, social services, education, and resource and land management. However, we also see a shift, uh, or as part of that process, we see a negotiation of the Yukon government taking over some of those services, such as health and education. So all in all, we see a lot of responsibilities getting put down to the local level, but this also means that we have a lot of need for more capacity and uh, different kinds of capacity. And this is where my, my research really focuses. But because before we can build any of this capacity, as we've seen through great literature, um, we need to understand what capacity is. So uh, a lot of, there have been many calls, both publicly and through political um, channels, for increased capacity in the north, but we don't have a good understanding of what that capacity actually should be or who it should be for and what we should do with it once we have it. So I wanted to take a step back and look at what capacity actually means from the literature. So we have this gentleman who's building, um, say a table, and he has a hammer and a nail. But before he can even start building his table, he needs to have a vision or the skill and uh, the idea of competency comes into play where he needs to have that basic understanding before he can even begin. But on top of that, he also needs the right tools or the capability to actually fulfill his vision. And so in the case of something like building a table with a hammer and nails, you would need a hammer. It's very possible to use a wrench or a screwdriver, but it wouldn't be as effective or as uh, streamlined. So if we take this up to the idea of governance capacity, then a particular hammer could be something like research capacity, which is the ability to use and engage and produce new knowledge. And this is really what I'm trying to explore through the EIA process. In the end of the day, as we move towards sustainable development, the different aspects of our society need to come together. And this is, Part of what I want to explore is the interactions between these different groups um, and how their different capacities, internal and external, and their abilities to interact with one another can actually contribute to sustainable development. And this includes things like academia, where the social sciences and the sciences make a contribution, but what kind of contribution and what kind of uh, abilities are they giving to others by producing that new knowledge? 
and with that, I would welcome questions and further exploration into what other opinions are on this particular topic. <laughs>